Um, good evening. Welcome to HBU Accounting Alumni Society. Um, I remember a year ago when I, introducing about, when I introduced myself, I always have to practice at home a thousand times saying a very, very long sentence. Um, my name is Raymond Tran. I'm a senior at HBU, majoring in business administration <laughs> with uh, an accounting with a master of accountancy. Um, and um, not until now, I realized that life after college is so wonderful because, <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, because now, um, uh, when introduce myself, when thinking of a line to introduce myself, it's, it's actually gets shorter. I can cut that line to half. I can just say, um, hello, I'm Raymond Tran. I'm HPU alumni, class of 2008. So um, yeah, I'm proud to be an alumni because, you know, no more class, no more tests. And no more Dr. Westcott. I'm just kidding. <laughs> She's wonderful, I just joke. <laughs> um, so on behalf of HBU alumni, um, HBU School of, Bus School of Business and um, HBU Accounting Alumni Society, I'd like to welcome all um, here and thank you very much for spending your time coming out and um, celebrating uh, this wonderful event. Um, your presence and your support will be very um, helpful in building a strong group of HBU alumni society. My, um, actually, my first intention of um, getting together this group um, was that um, so that we can be able to reconnect with alumni and use the light, the strength of the alumni to help each other in our careers and other matters in life, both personally and business related. I also thought that it would be a great chance to give back to the university both career um, and provide career opportunity to the current HBU students. I still remember back in the day I tried to apply for my first job and how hard it was to get a job. And I wish I could know some sort of um, someone that went to HBU and know what um, HBU education quality is and they can trust us more and give us a chance to show our talents. And um, so that's basically my first um, reason to think of forming these organizations, just to get together all the alumni and um, um, you know celebrate our achievements as well as helping out and giving back to the. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> celebrate your one day's achievements. <laughs> okay. Um, so, well, anyways, hopefully in the future, if um, I'm, I'm sure some of you may hold very good, um, you know, authority at your company or some of us may become a um, manager or hiring manager, we can come back to HBU and, um, you know, hire our wonderful, excellent students. Um, together with that, um, in the future, um, I hope that HBU Accounting Alumni Society will um, be able to um, progress uh, more and we will have more chances to hold uh, seminars or speeches um, as, as well as workshop uh, about matters uh, relating to accounting, finance, economics, and um, other things related to our disciplines. Um, and um, I hope to have more uh, of social events and uh, networking events um, so we can get together and have fun um, and learn from each other. All right, with that being said, I hope that all of you are and will continue to be a part of this wonderful society. Um, we also provide on your table a survey about this um, event today. Uh, please fill it out and uh, give us um, your thoughts about this, or this event and any recommendation you would like. Or um, if you would like to be um, an officer or help out with um, organizing events, please uh, indicate that in the survey. Um, I know there's not much space in the front page, but you, if you flip around and just write in the back, that would be helpful. Um, also, there's a program on the table so you can see where we're at. Um, all right, um, that's it for my part. Um, I've been practicing this for two days. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, I, I like to pass this to Yawandi, and she um, would like to um, give a, a evocation. everyone, my name is Yawande, graduated last year and really excited to be back. Um, so, get to see new people and meet new people. 
Um, hope we can all stay connected one way or another. But join me in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this gathering and thank you for the opportunity you've given us to come together, um, meet with old friends and make new friends. Thank you for the opportunities you've given us in life um, with our careers and I know times are tough with the economy and people getting laid off. I pray that whatever struggles people might be facing right now, you hold their hands through those and just give us strength. Um, we thank you sincerely for this school and the impact it has made in our lives. And I just um, pray that the accounting program and the College of Business overall would continue to grow. Um, and I pray for the students it has now. Just let, let your light shine through them and um, let this school be a light to the community. Let this be a wonderful time of learning and fellowship. In Christ's name, amen. All right, thank you, Yo Wande. Um, and uh, next will be our lovely favorite, Dr. Sherry Westcott, and she's gonna give us some update about the School of Business. Thank you, Raymond. Like Raymond, I'd like to Thank you for coming, welcome you to, for coming out. Uh, Dr. Karuvala couldn't be here, he's out of town or he would be giving you this update. Um, the School of Business has just been through what I would say is a season of changes. You notice we've had a name change from the College of Business and Economics, Kobe, as you affectionately knew it. This change brings us into alignment with the dominant practice that professions are known as schools rather than colleges. Dr. Uh, Mohan Karuvala, Dr. K, as you affectionately know him, he's now the dean of our, of our school. Dr. Mike Burke, some of you would have had classes with him. He is the associate dean for graduate programs. And Dr. Rusty Brooks, if you can believe, is the associate dean for undergraduate programs. Right now, the School of Business has about 500 majors out of about 2,500 enrollments in uh, the university. Across the university, we've just experienced a significant curriculum shift in a, sort of in a provincial sense. Uh, we've approved single majors. So that double business or that double major has gone away in the, in the School of Business. We now have a business core and then we've got six majors. We've got accounting, finance, marketing, management, economics, and also international business. The School of Business has a new center of Christianity and business. It's, the way it's been described to me, it's sort of a think tank type of an entity that has three areas, one leading to the other. Research, which then feeds into education, and then that feeds into outreach for the community. One of the areas in accounting that we're especially pleased about is the growing number of internships. You will, some of you will remember that Dr. K made a few sort of strategic placements, but now the students are kind of taking the bull by the horns. They're finding their own internships, or they're networking with alumni to get internships. And this is one area that I think the accountants, the accounting alums here can really be helpful because that really has strengthened our accounting program. Students are planning what semester they plan to take off. And actually, I forgot to talk about that. We, we no longer have quarters. Uh, we've just finished our first year on the semester system and uh, it's really a little more restful to do things twice rather than three times in nine months. A few of you here, and, and you surprised because you didn't RSVP, are uh, graduates of the five-year program, so I wanted to give you some statistics on that. Our very first entry was in 2003 with Anami Patel, if you remember. Our first graduate was in 2005. We now have 16 graduates of that program, and we have 11 students in process. 
So I've had one applicant for fall, so we're really, I'm really eager to see what our enrollment will be for this coming up year. Now I'm going to introduce Dr. Hunter Baker. He already, you already know who he is. Um, he came June 2007, joined the university. He's the university's director of strategic planning. He's also our associate provost, and he's an adjunct faculty in the Department of Government. He has a PhD in religion, politics, and society from Baylor University. He has a JD from the University of Houston Law Center. He graduated there, magna cum laude. He has a master's in public administration from the University of Georgia. And he has a Bachelor of Science in Economics and also in Political Science from Florida State University. Dr. Baker is author of a brand new book coming out nationwide the end of August titled The End of Secularism. The premise of this book is that secularism is of little value as a public philosophy and should be discarded as, as a failed experiment. He has authored numerous other scholarly publications, appearing in The American Spectator, Christianity Today, The National Review Online, just to name a few. Dr. Baker is married to Dr. Ruth Baker, but she is a medical doctor, not an academic. They have two children, a son, Andrew, who is seven, and a daughter, Grace, who is age four. Dr. Baker. <clears throat> well, hello and welcome back to HBU. For those of you who have been who have been gone, I'm very happy to have been asked to come and speak with you this evening. I'm particularly honored to be part of an event uh, with my colleague Vivian Camacho, who is our Director of Alumni Affairs. Vivian is just a tremendously uh, brave and faithful person, um, and I'm so happy to be here with her. As I stand here, I can't help but think about those surveys that tell us the number one fear of most people, even stronger than their fear of death, is the fear of public speaking. The first thing I want you to know is that public speaking is not one of my strongest fears. What is one of my great fears is that I will be forced to sit in a chair listening to someone who should have been afraid of public <laughs> speaking. <coughs> For that reason, I will be brief and to the point. <clears throat> I think the billing for this event says that I'm here to talk about bringing back the best of American higher education. As a prelude, I will tell you that I mean to talk about the importance of the liberal arts, the big ideas, and the great books. Indeed, I will talk about why those things are necessary to bringing back the best of American higher education. This is a message that I very much want to bring to seasoned professionals and budding professionals like yourselves. Uh, but before I launch into that, I want to announce that, it, you know, as you've heard from the introduction, I have at least some familiarity with your world, uh, the world of the professions by training at least. My first graduate degree was in public administration and the second one was in law. Um, I worked as a corporate analyst, an internal consultant who worked to re-engineer the corporation uh, once upon a time and, and as a, a lobbyist, uh, not the bad kind of lobbyist, a good kind of lobbyist. Um, it was not until that third graduate degree, the PhD, that I became a devotee of the liberal arts. But I say all this to you to reassure you I'm not some ivory tower academic so abstracted from the world I cannot remember to wear pants. Uh, they're here. Uh, <coughs> on the other hand, I am ashamed to admit I have found myself under running water in the shower with my socks and glasses on a few times. I entered college with a concern that is typical of most students and their parents which is, how will I make a living? Uh, you know, where I grew up, every, every young man grew up thinking he was gonna be an engineer. You can see I fell pretty far away from, from that goal. Uh, even though I was part of an honors liberal arts studies program, it was not terribly rigorous. Uh, this was at Florida State, and I lacked the appreciation of the material to get much from it. Besides, our courses, like the first two years of most colleges and universities, were a grab bag of whatever the school's faculty felt like offering to undergrads who were fulfilling their general studies requirement. The closest I came to real liberal arts training was a class in political thought. Oddly enough, it was taught by a statistician for the state of Florida. 
we did not read primary texts. I still remember writing a paper on the theorists John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham without actually reading either man's work. Despite that, my conclusions were very smug. After all, here I was in the late 20th century writing about men who were long since dead. Who needs to read what they wrote? Of course, I committed the modern fallacy, which is to assume that I was smarter because I live now rather than then. Regrettably, I had not learned from the wisdom of C.S. Lewis, who wrote that clocks and calendars are odd tools for figuring out who has the right side of an argument. <clears throat> it is far better and often easier to read Aristotle than to read about Aristotle. <clears throat> Today, I try to be a teacher who realizes both of these things. <clears throat> In the introductory course, my students read Aristotle, Augustine, Aquinas, and others. At least they are supposed to read them. <clears throat> we think that the first two years of college are a fair representation of the liberal arts, and they really aren't. Students come to college and take two years of courses that often have no coherent plan behind them. This is the legacy of a decision that Harvard University made many decades ago. Just let students decide what to take in the first two years. The plan proved attractive to many administrators and faculty members because it is flexible and it's very easy to service. Robert Hutchins, former dean of the Yale Law School and then president of the University of Chicago, <clears throat> fought very hard against this change. Uh, he believed that you could identify a core of the best that has been thought and said and written and that you could give students a powerful and edifying experience <clears throat> learning the great books and the great ideas. In fact, it was out of his vision that for many years the Encyclopedia of Britannica issued a very popular set of books called the Great Books. <clears throat> While he prevailed for a time at his own school, the University of Chicago, a great university, for the most part, this rigorous vision of the liberal arts was lost to history. It was something the great universities used to do. But today, after deca decades of exile, the liberal arts are coming back. Many universities, including ours, are redesigning their core curriculums around the ideal of the educated person. <clears throat> we are being intentional about giving students a foundation for learning and a fund of knowledge that can change their lives, their character, their perception, and their judgment. I wish I could say that it was purely idealism that has brought about this rebirth. Uh, in fact, accountants, it has a market basis. Uh, <laughs> I think that what is happening is that many college administrators can see into the future to a time when students will no longer agree to spend two years preparing to begin their major. Why get this particular training called a college degree if one could get professional training right away in accounting, law, software design, or what have you? That future is coming faster than we like to admit. In fact, partially, it's almost already here. But others of us, and in this group I include many HBU professors, our president, Dr. Sloan, our provost, Dr. Bonicelli, believe in our souls that genuine, carefully thought out liberal arts education of the kind once offered by the vast majority of American universities is actually good for students. We don't just want to find a way to legitimize tuition costs. We want to participate in the formation of the person. In other words, we say, I found something very special, something precious. Come and see. Let me tell you about it. For this proposition, I have the support of America's founding generation. They understood that a person is more than simply a unit of economic value. A person is more than their job. A person has been created by God for more than commercial activity. Because people are more because they are special in some way, they are entitled to rights and freedoms. But the problem from time immemorial was how people could be free while still maintaining the benefits of law and order. The American founders were very perceptive. They knew that freedom by itself is no great thing. Freedom is like a knife. It can be used for good, like the scalpel in the surgeon's hand, or for ill, like the switchblade in the hand of a mugger. But freedom with virtue, that is something special. A free people must be a virtuous people. This realization is part of why our founding fathers were not secularists. 
They believed in a working relationship between virtue, freedom, and religion. We study the liberal arts because they are about exactly this type of question. If we study the great books, the great ideas, then we have understanding when we talk about things like liberty, equality, freedom, responsibility, and accountability. Without understanding, we simply walk around like dolls with strings in our side that we pull out and say, freedom is good, equality is good, responsibility is good. Fine, we can say it, but do we know what we are talking about? Or are we like the bubble-headed denizens of Huxley's Brave New World? Or like Orwell's proles who give all their energy to devising lucky systems for winning the lottery when they live under brutal oppression? Do we understand these things well enough to merit the awesome responsibility of being free citizens in a democratic republic? The title of this presentation is Bringing Back the Best of American Higher Education. Like so many things that are American, I think the best of higher education is a hybrid. The ideal training for a young person living in a free society, I believe, consists of a strong foundation in the liberal arts and professional training. The student learns how to think, how to value the important things in life, and what it means to be free. And the student also learns how to do something good and productive professionally. Accounting is a brilliant example. How great is it to train an accountant who loves the truth, understands the rights and freedoms so hard won by those who went before us, and is an excellent accountant? I want to hire that accountant. The reason I made this my topic tonight is to pay homage to the founders of our university who envisioned exactly such an ideal for their school, and hopefully to pique your interest in what I'm talking about. I'll never forget a comment I once read by an HBU trustee offered over half a century ago. He said it is one thing to learn how to build an atomic bomb, but our university will make sure students have learned how to think about whether and when such a bomb might ever be used. That one statement makes the case very clearly. We must have technical knowledge and we must understand our values. I agree with the Yale Law professor Anthony Cronman who once said, the meaning of life is a subject that can be studied in school. At the right school it can. I pray we strive to be that kind of institution. I hope that you will want this kind of education for your children. I know I'm planning to seek it out for my young ones. I will leave you with the words of Sir Winston Churchill, perhaps the greatest leader England ever had and under the greatest adversity and a great master of both statecraft and soulcraft. These words are part of our official vision for the university which can be found on our website. The first duty of a university is to teach wisdom, not a trade, character, not technicalities. We must learn to support ourselves, but we must also learn how to live. Thank you for listening to me this evening and I'm thankful to Dr. Westcott for inviting me. Our next speaker is um, Maritza Day. We're very pleased to have, lost her, there, to have her with us. She is a CPA and president of Day West and Associates, which is a firm in Houston specializing in accounting and financial recruiting, both full-time and contract. Day West was founded in 1993, was named 23rd in the Houston 100, which is a listing of 100 privately held firms which are considered to make the greatest impact on Houston. During Maritza's career, she has been a financial analyst. I had no idea she lived in Australia twice. An auditor with PwC in England, as well as Arthur Anderson in Houston. As a recruiter and consultant over the last 20 years, she has successfully completed more than 550 financial searches linking leading corporations and public accounting firms with talented professionals. 
organizations about career and hiring solutions. Maritza earned a BBA in accounting, cum laude, from the University of Houston, and she's been a CPA for over 25 years. She serves on the board of directors of the Houston CPA Society and also on the board of directors of the Business Alumni Associ Association at the University of Houston. Maritza is a frequent speaker and writer about the workforce, and she is the author of two books. One is Networking to Build a Success. <laughs> authored 1,000 Best Job Hunting Secrets. Maritza, thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you. Yes, as Hunter said, I have learned in giving these speeches that the most important thing is to end on time. So I will do my best to do that. So uh, first of all, I, I, when I was talking to you all earlier, I, um, I was asked, well, why, I, w I actually grew up in this neighborhood. I grew up in Southwest Houston. And so I think Vivian asked me, you know, so why didn't you consider coming to HBU? It was my, actually, my dad was a professor. That's how we got to Australia. He was a Fulbright professor to Australia. But Vivian and I both went to the same high school, Sharpstown High School. So this is my HBU story. It's pretty short, so I'll tell it. Um, Go Apollos, right? Yeah, very good. You? <laughs> Wonderful. Fabulous. Okay, we'll friend each other and, you know, on Facebook. And uh, now we have quite the, the Sharpstown alumni thing going. There you go. There you go. So uh, I actually I went to Sharpstown High School. I was on the drill team. And we were very impressed with ourselves back then. That's right, Nefala Queens. And so I was telling Vivian that, that uh, we, were, we came here for the columns. You know, you've got those Greek columns. And we were the Sharpstown Apollos. It's that Greek connection. And uh, so we were practicing our poses, you know. And in front of this this glass office building sort of thing, so we were, we were doing this, no kidding. And then we realized, oh my God, there are people right in there looking at us. So immediately <laughs> we we slunk out of there. So we, that was that was pretty much my fondest memory, um, most embarrassing memory of HBU. But uh, I'm glad to be here, and I have to show you all this. Uh, Sherry graciously read that introduction that, that we wrote, and I did write this book called A Thousand Best Job Hunting Secrets, but what I wanted to show you all is I came back from Asia last uh, summer, I believe, and a few months later, I, my book was translated into Indonesian. So this job search stuff is international. And at the time I thought, Indone well, if I hadn't been to Indonesia, I would have thought, you know, so what, Indonesian? But it's the fourth most populous country in the, in the world after us. So, so what? Anyway, um, that's, that's the story. So if you guys want to read this in Indonesian, it's, it's available. <laughs> but anyway, but I, I'm here to talk to you all about finding shelter in the storm. I have a, a recruiting firm, and so we see a lot of uh, peaks and valleys in the, in the job market and in employment. And I've got to tell you, especially when I started, uh, I, I, didn't ha I didn't tell you all the, the year I graduated. Did you notice that? I didn't, but it's, it's been about 100 years. And uh, in the beginning of my career as a, as a recruiter, people, I always ask, what are the four things or three or four things you really want in, in a job? And you know, everybody wants challenge, uh, recognition. And I used to hear all the time security in the early years. Don't hear that anymore. Because the reality is everybody knows there ain't no security out there. The only security that's available is the security that you create for yourself, the way you manage your career, you manage your life. And I have a few hints for you. Uh, one of the main, is, the main hints is have skills the market wants to buy. I worked with a human resources consultant. This guy's 75 years old. And he's still working because he can and because he chooses to and because his skills are relevant to the marketplace. So that's really the bottom line. I guess I could quit talking right now, but I do have a few more, more tips for you. When I talk about marketable marketable skills, we can break those down into a few different skills. One would be what we consider functional skills. A lot of you guys are accountants. I heard there's a, there's a lawyer wannabe in the audience. You know, that's also a functional skill. Accounting, engineering, nursing, these are all functions. Um, industries, industry is a skill. I, I heard people from oil and gas, public accounting, that's actually an industry. Um, real estate healthcare, construction. These are all skills that are, uh, that there's a market for them. Uh, clearly computer skills 
are something that you want to maintain and develop and get new skills. The idea is all these skills that exist, you want to make sure that you keep them up to date, that you are aware of, of the marketplace. Um, each one of these, uh, if you're an accountant, keep, just keep current with some of the facts. When I was at, at Arthur Anderson, we got them in our mailbox, and I swear I didn't read any of them. But clearly, um, I haven't practiced accounting for 100 years, so, uh, it, but it is important to stay current with your functional skills, in, in industry skills, computer skills. And here are some skills that, especially for accountants, we tend to kind of push them aside, but those are the, the soft skills, the personal and professional skills. We tend to not emphasize those as much, but I will tell you, not only do I work with people, trying to help people get jobs, I work with corporations and public accounting firms that want to hire people. And in the simplest way, you're hired really for two main reasons. One is because you have the skills and experience they're looking for. That's the first reason. And then the second reason is that you are perceived to have the fit, the motivation, the, the personality to get along in that organization. And you know, just like people, every company has a personality. So the better you know yourself, the, uh, the better you can discern with a company if this is the kind of place for you. So with those two parameters, skills and experience, fit and motivation, what do you think is the percentage that that gets you hired, or, or what do you think? What percentage do you think is skills? What, is, what percentage fit? 35, pretty much, pretty much. She's clever. That's right. She said 35, 65. It's about that. It's about third, one third skills and experience, two thirds fit and motivation. So that's how you get hired. And let me tell you, not only do I do the hiring aspect, but I do the unhiring. It's called outplacement. When people are, you know, let go, they hire firms like ours to help people find a job. And uh, the, if, rarely, rarely do people lose their jobs because they're not technically qualified to do the job. It's more that maybe they're just, you know, it may be some kind of a fit or motivation issue. So don't underestimate that. And I got it. Here's my little soapbox for the CPAs. In the, most of you guys are certified or are going to be certified at some time. The, the uh, Texas Society, is, the, the Texas State Board of Ca Public Accountancy um, pretty much gives CPE credit for fairly technical subjects. There are so many soft subjects that are no longer qualified for CPE. And so therefore, a lot of CPAs stay away from them. You know, career development, you don't get credit for that anymore. Um, you know, some of that softer stuff. And that's the stuff that gets you hired. And that's the stuff that keeps you employed, those softer skills. So that is very important. Don't poo-poo the softer skills. So, so what are, I've talked about these soft skills. Clearly, those are written skills, your ability to write. When we were in public accounting, we had to write all these notes, and they had to be succinct and make sense. Um, so written skills are something definitely to work on. Verbal skills. Less is more, folks, in the business world. It, you know, you don't get paid extra for talking, saying something in, in 30 words that you could say in five. So it's the ability to communicate succinctly, like I'm trying to do, folks. <laughs> um, that it, it all comes down to this. Uh, have you heard of emotional intelligence? It's that it's Daniel Goleman wrote a book about emotional intelligence. It's the ability to, to deal with situations in, an, in a sort of intelligent, uh, intuitive manner. And I would uh, urge, uh, I would um, bet you that, that some of the most successful managers have a very high emotional intelligence, the ability to deal with people, read people. You can, and that is learned, folks. It's, it's not like IQ that you can't really influence that much. You can, through experience, learn how to work better with people. So work, try that. Uh, and the other thing is be easy to work with. I can tell you that I will fire the person who's hard to work with long before the person who's not as technically competent or technically qualified. Because if they're a pain to work with, you want them gone. So, you know, try to think in terms of how the listener perceives your message. And I, I, I don't know if that makes sense, be easy to work with, but be the one that they want to come to and give work and that they want to have in the meetings. Uh, that will help you in your career. 
And most of these hints I'm giving you there, you know, good times or bad, these, aren't, these are pretty decent ideas to, to think about. The other thing is, too, is um, circles of influence. Uh, who here is not tired of the word networking? You know, no. see that I said the way I said it. If you don't raise your hand, you're 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 with me. But anyway, um, clearly this is a network. Clearly this is a circle of influence. And I was talking to some young ladies here earlier. What my hope is for y'all is that you never lose a job. But if you if anything happens to your job, I would like you to be able to pick up the phone and and have three people that you could call right away to say, you know, I'm available. Help me out. Three or more. Um, I was telling a story of a gentleman I know who works for a company that's been in the news a lot, and he's very highly placed. And he was wondering, you know, he's got a lot of responsibilities. He was um, wondering about his job. Well, he, he got on the phone, and he has two jobs lined up if he needs it. He may not, but that's what I hope for y'all, that you have that network out there and you keep in touch. Um, I see a lot of people hibernate. They get a job in a nice big corporation, and they think that, that corporation is their mother or father, and that corporation will take care of them, and they really don't need to know anyone outside the company, please don't make that mistake. Keep your, your network, your, your circles of friendships alive, always. Uh, that's friends, family, loved ones, business acquaintance, everybody is a network. Uh, a ne quick networking story is, uh, there was a man who would take his dry cleaning to the, the dry cleaner every week. And he would always wear a suit and he'd look really nice. And so one day he shows up and he's in jeans. So the woman at the dry cleaner said, hey, what's, what's, what's wrong? You know, you've always, you always show up in a suit and now you're in jeans. And he said, well, I got laid off. She said, oh, really, what do you do? And he said, I do such and such. And she said, well, you know, I have no idea what you're talking about, but my brother-in-law sounds just like you. So. <laughs> So the, the guy said, can I have his number? He got his number. He called the guy. He got a job. So don't dismiss anyone or anything as a possible contact, truly. Your network is everywhere. And since I'm surrounded by financial people, I don't really have to say this, but um, I, I do mention this to some people. Well, I'll tell you, years ago, uh, somebody asked me, how do I become a millionaire? This is an accountant who asked me, how do I become a millionaire? And the, the lotto wasn't legal in Texas at that time, so I said, uh, spend less than you make over time. And that's a really good way to become a millionaire. Um, we've all gotten very frugal lately, but it's not a bad idea to continue that so that no matter what happens, you have a little cushion and you can, you can uh, have good cash flow and moderate leverage and all of that. So I'm speaking to the converted, I'm sure, in that regard. But most of all, when I think of security, it's really an internal thing. It's not an external thing. You can do all the techniques. Have you all noticed on the internet that there, there's a lot of these sort of gloss over hints for you about how to keep your job, like don't go on vacation or you know dress up or um, you know just come in early. You know these are all not bad ideas, but. The fundamental thing is to make a good foundation for yourself, like I talked about, with market, marketable skills that the market wants to buy, a good network where you can reach out and, and connect with people. And uh, most of all, um, I think to have perspective. If, you know, God forbid that any, anybody lose their job, but it's a job, and you can get another one. And if you've created this good, strong foundation for yourself, then it's, an, it's another project. And so a job, losing a job is a temporary loss. It's not a permanent loss anyway. But so to create a shelter or to create a sense of security for yourself, it's marketable skills, a good network, a little cash in the bank, and uh, then knowing that, that, it's, that there are many jobs out there and you only need one. So my, my favorite quote du jour is by Anna Lindbergh. Anna Mora Lindbergh, Any, you know the Lindberghs? Charles Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic, and yeah. Well, they had a pretty rough life, actually. Um, and the quote I, I love is, and, and so I don't wish you security. What I do wish you, uh, it, I'll quote Anna Lever, I don't wish, don't wish me happiness, wish me something I really need, strength, courage, and a sense of humor. So that is what I wish for all of you.
right. Um, thank you, Marissa. And uh, follow up will be um, Vivia Camacho, and she will talk about the alumni um, situation nowadays. Thank you, Raymond. Um, and I, I really want to make sure that Raymond and Winky get recognized tonight because without their um, idea, their inspiration to get this or the society going, we wouldn't be here tonight. And so they came to me and said, I have an idea, let's do it. And I was all excited about it because that's what the Alumni Association is all about. You all are the Alumni Association. It's not me, it's just not a handful of people, but your connection to HBU, your experience here is what keeps um, HBU moving and that you are the ones who are out there in the world taking what you've learned here at HBU and making an impact in the society around us. And so I'm so excited that y'all are here tonight because this is a lot of what's going on with the Alumni Association these days is really trying to find those areas of interest for our alumni so that they can have a place where they can call their own here at HBU. And so the fact that you're all accountants, that you all have that HBU connection, makes us all stronger. It makes you stronger in the workplace when you can connect to others who are like you. And it makes HBU stronger because then we have that reputation going through you of what you've learned and what you can do in the world around you. And so um, Maritza was talking about that network. And so I'm all about networking and doing it either in a, a formal way this way, face to face, or online. Um, I'm sure everybody here is either on Facebook or LinkedIn and have that connection. And so the more we can do that, the more that I have that tool that I can use when I have people call my own office, and I've had that happen a lot recently. I need to connect to other alumni. I want to see where HBO alumni are so they can help me. I've lost my job. I'm looking for something. And I can pull up that information and get them connected to different people in their areas. So I encourage you all to be a part of that, to be a part of LinkedIn. We have one for the Alumni Accounting Society. We have one for the HBU Alumni Association in general, as well as Facebook. And it's so important to be able to, to have other people like you out there who will say, oh, I went to HBU too. I knew Dr. Westcott, and I knew, I knew Rita Tower. And so that brings you closer together. I do have out here on the table um, something from our Career Services Office. If you are in need of that, if you want to get in contact with our Director of Career Services, that is available to you as alumni. There is a network of jobs, a job bank, um, different employers that um, Ms. Reynolds keeps in touch with. And so fe please feel free to get in contact with that office if you need to. Um, also to make yourselves available to others who may be in need for our students who are looking for a mentor to someone who can give them that hand up to where they are and where they want to be. Um, and so again, you are our greatest ambassadors and to that end, one of these events would not be complete without some giveaway items so that you can go back to your offices, go back to your, your homes, and you can advertise HBU in your workplace. So I'm going to ask Raymond to give me a hand. He's going to bring that up. He's already thinking for me. And I'm going to pull some names out of here. So again, thank you for coming. You are so valuable to us. And as a note of that, I'll, I'll plug the um, College of Continuing Studies one more time because I do credit in some way alumni of this university helping to plant the seed for that. We had an envisioning uh, meeting so, uh, a couple of years ago when Dr. Sloan was here after his first year, Carolyn Swan was here, and there was that recommendation, some questions came up from the alumni of why can't we do like a college of con continuing studies. And so here we are. And so just remember your value to HBU. We love you. We always want you to be a part of us. And again, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you.